So Death Stranding for Mac has finally been released and I think that it is one of the most exciting ports that's ever been released on Apple Silicon Mac so far. Not only can Death Stranding run at max graphics settings at 4K at more than 60 FPS on the latest and greatest M3 Max, but it'll also scale down to the Pro and base models and you'll even get very playable frame rates on the lowliest M1 MacBook Air. And you know what, it'll even run on your iPhone as well. And in this video today, we're going to be looking at Death Stranding running on a variety of different Apple Silicon Macs. We're going to be examining how various settings affect performance. We'll look at the App Store launch, controller support, HDR, as well as quality of life issues, and take a look at whether you should be buying one of the best Mac ports that's been released so far. So the first thing I'm going to say is that if you have a high-end Mac, for example, this is the M3 Max chip, then you're in for an absolute treat because this can run the game at 4K at the very high setting and both gameplay and cinematics rarely dip below 60 frames per second. In fact, I'm having difficulty knowing how fast this can actually run the game because when my N3 Max is connected to my capture card, the frame rate cap is limited to only 60 frames per second. But when we're using the very high graphics preset, we have Metal FX Temporal Upscaling set to Ultra. So technically this is a 1440p image being upscaled, which is partially why this is hitting 60 FPS. However, if we manually turn off Metal FX, then we can see the true 4K resolution being rendered. And often the M3 Max chip and my MacBook Pro 16 inch can hit between 50 and 60 FPS. And I played several hours of Death Stranding at 4K with Metal FX turned off, and it very rarely dropped under 50 FPS, only really coming close during really intense graphical scenes like this. So I wanted to see the true effect of the Metal FX upscaling. So I used my iPhone camera to take these videos so that we could see the frame rates without being capped by my capture card. And here when we crank up the metal effects at 4K, getting pretty big increases to frame rates. For example, spatial upscaling performance is an uplift of nearly 40%. Now I think that the best use case for metal effects isn't with the high-end machines, but with the low-end ones. So this is the MacBook Air with the base M1 chip. And with metal effects turned off running on low at 1080p, we're only getting about 26 frames per second. However, using metal effects temporal upscaling on performance mode, we're able to increase our frame rate up to about 42 frames per second, which is a roughly 60% an increase and if we make use of metal effects spatial upscaling instead we increase this number to 47 frames per second which is an 80 percent uplift however using metal effects upscaling has its graphical costs too and even though spatial upscaling provides better performance you can see quite a lot more jagged alias lines especially in the distance so i've tended to prefer the temporal upscaling which is on by default on those settings we've talked about gaining frames but how about losing frames by cranking up the graphical quality so here i'm running the same scene in gameplay on low medium medium default and very high. Generally speaking, on low settings, the MacBook Air is running about 50 FPS, but if we pull up to very high graphics settings, then we're getting about 30 FPS. This also applies to the super detailed cutscenes you're gonna see all throughout Death Stranding. And I'd say that because this game prioritizes immersion and graphics and the performance of all of the actors, I'd say that it might be worth cranking this up to target that 30 FPS mark. So even if you're running on, let's say a base M1 Apple Silicon Mac, you could run this on default are very high and then supplement this with temporal upscaling. I think it might be worth doing because this game really rewards graphical quality in order to not fall into the uncanny valley. And it's cool to see that this game can perform so well even on a fanless base M1 Apple Silicon MacBook Air which is now already over three years old. And as we go further up the Apple Silicon Mac lineup to more recent Macs, for example the M2 chip in the MacBook Air here, we can start to afford to turn up the graphics settings a bit. So this is running at 1080p medium and we're now able to hit that 60 to 70 fps mark and in this example here we're comparing the m1 macbook air against the m2 macbook air side by side the m2 is nearly 50 percent faster than the base m1 similarly if we're looking at something a bit more high-end for example the m1 max chip with 32 gpu cores getting on average between about 150 to 200 percent increase in performance now, unfortunately, I don't have a mid-range Mac, for example, the M1 Pro, so I borrowed footage here from Mac Pro Tips and user Jay Fishin. Make sure to check out Mac Pro Tips' YouTube channel. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. Here, the game is being run at 1440p on default settings, and the game is running at a very respectable 45 to 50 FPS. So rest assured that even if you're using the M1 Pro, which is now two years old, this is fully capable of running the game really well. And similarly, a lot of people ask me about whether the M1 Max can also run the game at high resolution. And whilst it isn't as fast as my M3 Max, which capped out at 60 frames per second, the M1 Max is more than capable of getting a very respectable 40 to 50 frames per second at the very high graphical setting. 
And speaking of settings, a lot of people ask me about the temperature and the fan speeds. So this is running on my N3 Max at max graphics settings. Fans are about 50% and the GPU is running at about 90 degrees Celsius. Externally, it's running about 48 degrees at the very hottest part of the Mac. If you really wanted to make your Mac run cooler, just cap the frame rate to say 30 or turn down other graphics settings too. And then GPU cores will go down to 75, 80 degrees and then the fans will completely turn off. And if you're using a fanless device like the MacBook Air, the thermal performance is actually quite good. Today I've got this running at 1080p on very high graphics preset. It'll hit around 90 degrees Celsius with a maximum of around 38, 39 degrees Celsius where the exhaust vent is. And this isn't too bad for a completely passively cooled computer. And in any case, if you want lower temperatures, just lower the settings and you'll be fine. Speaking of which, if your Mac happens to support high dynamic range or HDR, which has support on all recent MacBook Pros, then this game has great support for that feature. I can't show you with the camera that I have on this video, but rest assured it's really worth turning on and taking advantage of that beautiful Apple screen. Speaking of which, the game also has native ultra wide 21 by 9 support. Strangely, it shows up as 3660 width, resulting in tiny black bars on the left and the right, but it seems to have good ultra wide support. But one thing that doesn't seem to make any sense at all is the fact that we only have 21 by 9 or 16 by 9 support. This is despite the fact that virtually all MacBooks use 16 by 10 or more, resulting in black bars on the top and the bottom of the game. However, it is possible to mod in 16x10 support or any custom resolution that you want. You can find out details on how to do this in the link in the description. And let's talk about controller support. So here I'm using a DualSense PlayStation 5 controller. And what's very cool is that we have adaptive trigger support, which basically adds resistance and another level of immersion, which is pretty cool as in this game, you're gonna be holding the L2 and R2 triggers a lot. Unfortunately, I found that there was no support for controller rumble. I'm sure that this is an oversight. Hopefully this will get patched in in the future. There are plenty of options for controls as well and you can even assign different controller icons and you also have motion control support for things like soothing your bb which i discovered in a recent live stream this works this will get your baby placed in child protective services if you did this and finally let's talk about how cool it is that you can buy one copy of death stranding and it'll work on both your mac your iphone and your ipad all with one single purchase you'll be able to play on your phone and then your save games will just sync straight to your mac and you'll be able to dive right back into the game and whilst this is a really cool feature it's also a bit of a double edged sword especially for Mac gamers and that's because you'll be forced to use the dreaded Mac App Store. So no, the Steam version of Death Stranding that you might bought on your Windows computer doesn't have the Mac port. You'll have to buy this game from the App Store and this will be fine if the Mac App Store actually worked well but on the actual launch day of the game myself and many other Mac gamers had loads of issues actually downloading the game in the first place. Firstly, if you want to buy the game at all you need to have enough storage space. You can't even make the purchase without it. And whilst the game is only 70 7 gigabytes in size, you actually need double the amount of storage space in order to do the download and the purchase. And there's no option for the Mac App Store to download to an external drive, so you need 150 gigabytes free on your internal computer. And if you're one of those suckers who bought 256 gigabyte MacBook Airs, then I'm sorry, you're out of luck. You're going to have to clear out almost all of your storage from your Mac before you can download this game. And that's assuming that you can even download at all. When I downloaded the 77 gigabytes of data, it said at the end, unable to install. And then I just had to restart the download all over again. And yes, by the way, the Mac App Store speeds are actually really slow and it's not really acceptable in this day and age. And the final nail in the coffin is that once you actually download the game, you might have some trouble launching at all. And what they don't tell you is that you need to be signed into Game Center first. Once you're signed in, then the game will actually launch properly. Now, these launch day issues are definitely problems. But at the end of the day, once you get this game onto your Mac, whether it's the high end M3 Max or the low end M1 MacBook Air, you're going to have a fantastic experience nonetheless. And I definitely recommend that you try try it out because it's been one of the most interesting, scary, horrifying, atmospheric and philosophically interesting games that I've played for a really long time. And if you own a Mac, then you owe it to yourself to get one of the best Mac ports that's ever been made. So make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out the next live stream that I do. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.